Right, I mean, wired her up so that every time that she uh, speaks heresy, she gets an electric shock. Uh, we're going to pray for her. Father God, we thank you for Leslie Lord. We thank you for uh, her ministry uh, amongst us. Lord, we just uh, thank you for all the work that she's put in, praying through this passage and hearing you, Lord. And so we pray for her now that you'd bless her. And Lord, did you open our hearts and minds to hear your word to us. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 That should come up on the screen, then you're going to read it. Am I reading the passage? Yes. Right. <laughs> I'm reading the passage. So, uh, if you've got your uh, you've got a pew Bible and you want to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it is on page 1153. And otherwise it's up there uh, on the screen. Now, about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between Spirits, to another speaking in different <coughs> kinds of tongue, and still to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of the one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its main parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptised by one Spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body. It would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? So if the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honourable, we treat with special honour. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honour to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honoured, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, 
and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all have gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret. Now, eagerly desire the greater eagerly desire the greater gifts. And yet, I will show you the most excellent way, which comes next week. You got that, you don't need it. <laughs> Okay, spiritual gifts. I'm sure many of you will have been on courses on this subject and you will know that they could take a minimum of six weeks. So stupid that I am, I've agreed to do this in about 25 minutes to half an hour. So you will understand that I'm going to give just the briefest of overviews. I do intend to touch on most of the gifts, but it will be the briefest of overviews. For many of you, you will already know it. For those who don't, I'm hoping it will whet your appetite to find out more. Um, if, and the other thing I'm going to do is, apart from giving a brief overview, is to just give some of reflections of my own on these things. And at the end of time allows a very brief example from my own experience, which should bring it a bit more alive, I think. Let me say first what I won't be doing. I won't be covering the gifts found elsewhere in the scriptures, the gifts in Romans and Ephesians. I was really pleased that that Nick actually read that reading from Romans. It doesn't mean that there are any lesser, there are no lesser or better gifts. It just means that I don't have time to do that and that isn't the scripture I've been given. But that's just a heads up that they are there. I won't also be talking too much about the gifts of administration or the gifts of help. Thank God for administrators. What would we do without them? <laughs> so, such an important gift, but fairly self-evident. The same as the gift of helping and being kind. We hear about that all the time in just about every sermon. So I won't be, be covering those. And the other thing I won't be covering is prophecy, although it is listed here. Because this gift makes a detailed appearance in chapter 14. And we have another speaker coming to talk on prophecy. That chapter, chapter 14, also goes into some details about tongues and interpretation of tongues in the context of a church service. I emphasise that because there is a gift of tongues as a, a devotional gift and there is one, the same gift, but a different usage in a service. And that can often be linked to prophecy. So that speaker may want to talk about that because there's a lot about it in chapter 14. So what I will be doing is just sharing a reflection or two on the gift of tongues as a prayer language, as a, an agent of worship. Okay. So just a word or two where I'm coming from on this subject, if you haven't already guessed. <laughs> I think the church, and I don't mean just this church, I mean the church in general does its best. But to function the way she should and could, she needs the power of her Lord and the energy and the activity of the Holy Spirit. Like you, I have read the Book of Acts and I see operating in the lives of those Christians something that I believe is no less available to us today. I'm talking, of course, about spiritual gifts, or the charismata, as they're sometimes called. They're God's answer to the human question, why can't we do that? They are the manifestation and power of God, the Holy Spirit. And before we actually start having an overview, I just want to emphasise for me, this is so important. There's, there's a crucial principle that we need to understand right from the outset. Spiritual gifts are not God bestowing on his people something outside of himself. They are not some tangible stuff separate from God. They are, in fact, nothing less than God himself in us and working his purposes through us. So let's take a brief look at them. I'm going to start with the words of wisdom and knowledge. I'm often putting them, you know, I'll be saying a bit about each one, but a lot of these interlink. 
you'll find that there's a lot of overlap in these gifts and they often complement one another. So to start with the words of wisdom, it's fairly self-explanatory, isn't it? This gift describes a sense of divine direction. So it's not human wisdom, it's divine. It's something that God gives. It's being led by the Holy Spirit to act appropriately in a given set of circumstances. It's knowledge rightly applied. Wisdom often works together with knowledge and with discernment. The word of knowledge, or the words of knowledge, this is a supernatural knowing. It's not the kind of knowledge that you'd have just from being clever or working something out. It is a supernatural knowledge that God gives you. Now, some examples of these gifts in operation, I've had to restrict myself. There's so many I'd love to have given for each of the gifts, but we'd be here all evening. In Matthew 9, Jesus is described as knowing the thoughts of the scribes. And in Luke 9, Jesus again is described as knowing what the disciples were thinking. And perhaps the most frequently quoted example of this gift of knowledge is when Jesus tells the Samaritan woman, all the secret sins of her life. He showed the gift of knowledge here, but also the gift of wisdom in the way he approached her and spoke to her. And this gift was also seen in the disciples too. Ananias was given knowledge in a vision of a man called Saul. Now are these merely instances of revelation of some sort or the gift of prophecy? Or are they examples of the words of wisdom and knowledge? Well, there's been a lot of ink spilt trying to categorise which one fits in where. <laughs> and there's many different ideas about it. It may be that we will never know. And I can't help thinking that we don't actually need to know exactly what category one particular thing comes into. What's important for us to know is that God still speaks and does so for the blessing and encouragement of his people. So let our prayer be, speak Lord, I'm listening. Then we come to faith and healing. I've put these together because they're often seen together in scripture. So before I say anything about healing, a few words about the gift of faith, the charismata of faith. Because the New Testament doesn't explicitly refer to the charisma, the charismata, or gift of faith, outside of this passage in 1 Corinthians 12. So the best way to identify the nature of this gift is to look briefly at how faith is portrayed in different ways. Generally speaking, the New Testament mentions three dis distinct contexts in which we see faith. The first is conversion faith. This is exactly what it says on the tin. When we have faith to believe that Jesus died and rose again for our sins, we are converted. We come to faith, conversion faith. Then we have continuing faith. This is the faith that we exercise in our daily lives as we believe that God is with us and guiding us. It's the faith that is one of the fruits of the Spirit, and it is the faith of Hebrews 11. All Christians have this faith. But if you're like me, its intensity varies. <laughs> Sometimes it's easy to believe the promises of God. It's easy to believe that God is with you, especially when you've got all your ducks in a row and everything's going fine. At times of difficulty and hardship, it's a bit more challenging. At such times, one of my favourite prayers is, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And that was a prayer that Jesus answered. Then we come to charismatic faith. This is the faith seen in the Bible that appears to be the more obviously supernatural activity of God, where it's probably a bit more difficult to have faith for us normal mortals. Let's look at some examples. I've restricted myself to two. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. I tell you the truth. If anyone says to this mountain, go, throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. 
Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Well, of course, a mountain represents an immovable obstacle, some really difficult obstacle in your life that you think can never be moved. So it's faith for that. That's the kind of faith that's referred to here. And the second one is any one of you sick. He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Well, I've prayed for many people, and I'm sure Benedict says, I'm sure we all have. And we haven't always seen them healed. So this is something else that's referred to here, I think. Doesn't mean that we don't carry on, by the way. I'm going to come to that. We don't give up, ever. So it may not seem that every member of the body of Christ operates in this gift. But it would appear that we're all potential candidates for it. The gift of faith should probably be regarded as occasional or spontaneous. I copied that quote from a, um, a commentary I read. And I don't know about that, you know. It, it, that's what the commentators think, and they're probably right. I really don't know. Just because we see things only happening occasionally, does that mean that this is the only way the gift is meant to operate? I'm not sure. I don't always want to take my faith from what I see. <laughs> but it does seem that this gift of faith is definitely a supernatural gift of confidence that someone will feel in a particular situation of need or challenge, which gives them what they need, which is an extraordinary supernatural certainty that God is about to act. I've heard of people having this happen to them. They've been confronted with somebody terribly, terribly ill, terribly um, incurable. And they thought, oh my goodness, and God has given them this gift. And that person has been healed. It's not the healer, it's God that does get, provides that at that time. So linking faith, ordinary faith, continuing faith, this kind of faith and healing. In scripture, sometimes the faith of the person needing healing is instrumental. At other times, it's the faith of a friend or family member. Sometimes it's the faith of the person praying for the one who needs healing. And on certain occasions, I love this, faith apparently plays no part whatsoever in the healing. In John's Gospel, faith is never mentioned as a condition for healing. So you see, you can't pigeonhole God. There's a mystery about healing. Gifts of healing are subject to God. No one, not even Paul, could always heal all diseases. But we should continue to pray for people to be healed. Whether or not they are healed rests with God. But I fervently believe that God always does something, even if it's not tangible, in response to compassionate and believing prayer. So now we come on to miracles, or what is called, in some versions, miraculous powers. Is it okay to pray for a miracle? Well, before you answer that, listen to this from Acts 4, which is a record of the prayer of the early church in Jerusalem. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness, stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. I trust that no one here would accuse those believers of emotionalism or mental imbalance. Evidently, they didn't believe there was any inconsistency between miracles and the message of the gospel, between the wonders for which they prayed and the word of the cross that they so fervently preached. But you might be thinking, didn't Jesus rebuke as wicked and adulterous those who crave and seek after signs? Well, yes, he did. But the people he denounced were unbelieving scribes and Pharisees not Christians. These people were desperate for a way to justify their unbelief and rationalise their refusal to follow Jesus. If our prayers for power come from a desire to see God glorified and to see his people delivered, set free and healed, healed, I hardly think that Jesus would respond to us as he did the religious leaders of his day. 
Some examples in the scripture of what Paul means by workings of power or miracles could include those instances where the dead were raised, example where Peter raised Tabitha from the dead. Perhaps nature miracles would be included, such as turning water into wine, stilling the storm on the Sea of Galilee, and reproducing food, <laughs> feeding the 5,000. Perhaps supernatural deliverances or exorcisms are included as well. Are miracles the cure-all for the problems in the church and society? No, of course they're not. Jesus is. But the Jesus who entered this world and ministered to people, the Jesus who created the church and is its Lord, that Jesus is a miracle-working Jesus. And I don't believe that he was or is at all reluctant to be described as such. And if God should graciously equip us to minister in the miraculous, neither should we be. Next up is prophecy, which, as I said, I'm leaving for a future speaker. And then we come to the gift of... I know that I'm rushing through this. It's a bit of a cook's tour, but I hope you're still with me. <laughs> This is the gift of distinguishing of spirits, which is sometimes called the gift of discernment. I'm inclined to believe that this is the ability to distinguish between works of the Holy Spirit and works of another spirit, either a demonic spirit or perhaps even the human spirit. Some instances in the scriptures include Acts 16, where Paul discerned that the power of a certain slave girl was in fact demonic. In everyday life, we come across people with this gift where they're able to discern the presence of demonic spirits in a room or at their place. They're often used for ministries of deliverance and exorcism in the church. Another biblical example could be in John 2 when it's said that Jesus knew what was in a man. I love that. It said that he never judged by the, the surface. He always knew what the spirit that was in somebody. And I was reminded of this the other day in a meeting that we had. I won't go into the details of the meeting, but there were several of us at the meeting. And we were discussing a particular ministry, not, not a ministry that's in this church. And one of our number said, I have a check in my spirit about that ministry. And I think that's valid. That's something God-given. You don't have to have a reason for it. You just have to have a check in your spirit, which tells you it probably was a discernment. That purple was exercising at that moment as he or she saw it, the gift of discernment. So now we come on to the gift of tongues. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than you all. That's not me speaking. <laughs> you might think these are the words of a mystic or perhaps an over-the-top charismatic. They are, in fact, the words of the Apostle Paul. Evidently, Paul's spiritual life was regularly given to praying, singing and praising in tongues. And he was not in the least bit hesitant or embarrassed to say so. He was profoundly grateful to God for this gift. The gift of tongues as a prayer language is simply the spirit-energised ability to pray, worship, give thanks or speak in a language other than your own or one you might have learned. As I said earlier, there was more about the use of this gift in the context of a church service in chapter 14. The gift of tongues has been one of the most divisive and controversial issues in the church. You very rarely find somebody that's neutral about this spiritual gift. But we must never forget that the gift of tongues was God's idea, not man's. He, or persons, sorry, I'm not being politically correct. <laughs> He gave this gift to the church, no less than the other gifts. Contrary to the caricatures that some have of the gift of tongues, most people will testify how it has deepened their relationship with Jesus, which is precisely what prayer and praise are supposed to do. Just because a person has a gift, it doesn't mean that they will be mature in using it. The Corinthians are a prime example the church in Corinth, as far as we know, had all the gifts, but despite this, they were in a mess spiritually. Many of the gifts were abused, and some people saw their gifts as superior to others. The very thing 
that Paul warned against. There is no place whatsoever for superiority or inferiority in the body of Christ. We're all equally valued and all our gifts are required. When they're exercised by us in the context of love, love for one another and for those outside, the church will function as she should, as she was always meant to. Now, it was at that point when I first made these notes that I was going to stop. But I was having a niggle from God. Do you know when God gives you a little niggle? And um, he was saying to me I should share an example from my own experience. I hadn't got the faintest idea where to start with that. Over all these years, what could I possibly do? What, what would he want me to say? But within seconds, he gave me what he wanted me to say. So I'll briefly tell you what that was. The year was 1993, a long time ago. It was a time when many churches were going through a renewal. And it was also a time when I felt God speak to me that he was going to bring healing into my life. He also spoke about plans for my future. I kept these promises to myself. The promises were detailed, not vague. A short while after this, I was visiting a Baptist church in my hometown for an evening meeting with a friend. The church was hosting a guest speaker who was talking about his ministry behind the Iron Curtain in the 1980s. He smuggled Bibles and arranged meetings there and had been imprisoned several times. He was an absolutely lovely man, I remember that, very humble. And I emphasise this church was not charismatic. At the end of the meeting, there was an altar call. I can't remember what it was for, but I think it was, for gen it was general, for those who wanted to give their lives to Jesus, as well as those who wanted prayer for anything else. So I found myself walking to the front. I can't remember what I wanted prayer for, but it had been such a powerful meeting, and I think I probably was just seeking more of God. But as I got nearer to the front, this is where I'm going to find it so difficult to explain. <laughs> I'm going to do my best. As I got nearer to the front, walking like this, something happened. It's incredibly difficult to explain, but it felt as if I had walked into what I can only describe as a powerful force field. I can't think of anything else to, to describe it. So I paused and took a step backwards. Everything was normal. Then I took a step forward and there it was again. A totally, completely different atmosphere. How can I describe it? Well, it was difficult to stand upright, that was for sure. There was a feeling of being drunk, but not in a bad way. None of the effects that you get with alcohol, like dizziness or nausea. This was a feeling of intense peace that I, I couldn't possibly describe, and holiness. I felt the presence of God so strongly, I felt I could almost reach out and touch him. Let somebody help Paul. That this incredibly strong presence of Christ. And I also remember feeling, as well as feeling as if I was going to fall over, it didn't feel unpleasant. That, I hope I'm not making it sound unpleasant. It was absolutely wonderful. And I felt as if my movements were in slow motion. <laughs> you must think I'm crazy. You know when you see something on the television or on a video and it's slowed right down, sometimes get it in sports. It was like that. It was like my movements were all like that. It was... When I say weird, but in the best, most wonderful way, you just if I died and gone to heaven, I'd have been happy. It was amazing. And then a young woman came to pray for me. I'd never met her. She'd come with this guy, this um, preacher that was giving the testimony. And I think I just asked her to pray over me as the Spirit led. She then spoke over me in detail all the promises that God had given to me. I emphasise this was no general prayer that could have applied to anybody. It was specific and contained stuff that no one could possibly know. I never told anybody all these things, and to this day I haven't. She said, she prefaced a lot of her remarks with, I know this sounds a bit far-fetched, but I believe God is saying, and then she'd tell me, 
And what she said would have been ridiculously far-fetched had it not been for the fact that God had told me himself beforehand. I returned to my seat. By, by this time, I was practically so drunk I could hardly stand up. I returned to, returned to my seat when my friend had been praying. And she was a very level-headed, down-to-earth person, not given to flights of fancy at all. But she said, I was praying for you when you were up there, and you'll never believe what God showed me. And she repeated this stuff, which for her was anathema, you know, because this was crazy stuff. Now, this happened in part at least several times over the years to come, always in settings where I knew no one. Why? Why did God keep doing that? I believe God kept reminding me of his promises to encourage me and keep me going, a bit like he had to do with Abraham, I suppose. So with regard to spiritual gifts, what were we seeing here? Well, I believe we were seeing, and well, certainly some of us, experiencing something miraculous in the atmosphere around the front of that church, as I have described it. I also believe we were seeing words of knowledge and prophecy that were given to me. Over the years since then, I've, I have experienced much of the healing that God promised, enough to be very grateful, but not all of it. As to my future, there have been many bumps in the road, but God has done some amazing things and blessed me in so many ways. But there still remain things that I'm waiting for and expectant for. I don't know why God sometimes heals, sometimes partially heals, and sometimes doesn't heal. I don't know why prophecies don't always seem to happen the way we expect or in the time frame we expect. But I do know this. There are times and seasons in the plans of God. There are times of an outpouring. Sorry. There are times and seasons in the plans of God. There are times of an outpouring of the Holy Spirit times we would call renewal or revival. Many years after this event, I was reading a book authored by people who had lived through the Hebridean revival of 1949 to 1951. And there was a description which I recognised. I jumped up and down when I read this book. I thought, how did they know? <laughs> this author was talking about a supernatural atmosphere, exactly what I'd experienced. I, I haven't got all the words for it because it takes too long to say, that occurred on these islands, sometimes on one side of the road and not on the other, just like forwards or backwards, it's not there, and sometimes on one side of the island and not on the other. One house would be affected, another house wouldn't. When boats were coming in, as they reached a certain point in the water, they were affected by it. And I recognised this description immediately. It was unmistakably what I had experienced in that church. But here's the good thing. This in the Hebrides was happening out there, in the community. It was happening out there. And everybody who was touched by it was affected by it. They gave their lives to Jesus without anyone even praying for them. And they just flooded into the churches. This was a revival in response to the prayers of just a handful of people, dedicated, heartfelt prayer, and it was answered. In such times of refreshing, when God pours out his spirit, we see things that we may have thought were not possible and things we've waited a long, long time for. Finally, let's remember that the gifts are for the common good, but we mustn't think they're gifts simply for the church. They aren't. We get to practice them here, in order to be effective for God out there, on the street, in the office, on the train, in the pub, over lunch, anytime, anywhere. As David Pitchers used to say, the meeting place is the training place for the marketplace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would graciously pour out your spirit and revive the church and the country in our time. We ask that you be manifest in our communities. We thank you for your gifts. May the church be a place where your gifts abound, where they flourish among your people. Give us the humility to seek your good gifts and the boldness to step out in them. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.